Hi folks, following on from the footsteps of a successful F28 professional release and version 1.2 update, we thought now would be the perfect time to delve into some of the F28 systems in greater detail. In this video we'll cover what is personally one of my favourite features of the F28 professional and that is the depth of simulation we've been able to achieve in the flight control system. In normal operation, the F28 uses hydraulically powered flight controls. So we'll start this video covering the two hydraulic panels in the cockpit. The first hydraulic panel is located on the left hand side of the secondary instrument panel. Various indicators here show the hydraulic fluid quantity and system pressure in each of the two systems. System 1 is also known as the utility system and system 2 is known as the flight control system. The names are slightly misleading as the flight controls are actually powered by a mix of both systems and actually the majority of flying controls are powered by the utility system. We'll put a full list of what flight controls are powered by each hydraulic system on the screen now. Four switches are located on this panel labelled normal and offload, which can be used to offload one or both of the hydraulic pumps in each system. The respective pump light will illuminate whenever the pump is not operating normally. Moving down to the aft pedestal, we also find the hydraulic system flight control panel. Here we see 8 switches and 8 caution lights. Each of the primary flying controls has 2 switches and 2 lights. During normal operation, all switches should be in the on position and all lights should be extinguished. If one of the lights is illuminated, that would indicate that the respective hydraulic actuator is not working normally. The light will also illuminate if the corresponding switch is moved to the off position as the flow of hydraulic fluid is no longer powering the actuator. As this panel is not in the direct eye line of either pilot, and as it is fairly critical to the safety of the flight, a repeater flight control caution light is fitted to the secondary instrument panel, which illuminates whenever a light illuminates on the hydraulic system flight control panel. Each of the primary flying controls has three modes of operation. First mode operation is when both hydraulic pumps in the same system are operating normally and all flying control surfaces are operated by both their hydraulic actuators. Second mode operation comes into effect when one pump in a hydraulic system has failed or is offloaded. Although caution lights will illuminate on the secondary instrument panel, there should be no noticeable difference in feel in this mode as each of the primary flight control surfaces only requires one hydraulic pump to be operational to achieve normal system pressure. Third mode operation comes into effect when both hydraulic pumps in the same system have failed or have been offloaded. In third mode operation, each of the flight controls has its own unique operating mechanics, which we'll delve into now. The elevator will be in direct manual control now, with much higher forces required to push and pull the yoke. Under normal operating conditions, the elevator is hydraulically boosted at a 4 to 1 ratio. So without hydraulic power, the elevator is four times harder to move. This movement is simulated and makes the controlling of the elevator feel much heavier without hydraulic assistance. The rudder is also under direct manual control now. You'll notice the rudder is a little harder to move on the ground as you're having to move the entire mass of the rudder directly through the pedals. However, above 200 knots, the forces required to move the rudder become significantly higher due to the increased air flow and over the rudder surface, which is noticeable during flight. The ailerons are an interesting yet somewhat complex topic that requires some deeper explanation. In first and second mode operation, the ailerons move as you would expect any control service to move, as one complete surface. However, one common misconception we've seen mentioned a few times since release is regarding these tabs on the aft edge of the ailerons. 
These are often referred to as trim tabs, which is not the case. These are actually control tabs, which are mechanically locked in place in first and second mode operation and only become operational once hydraulic power to that aileron has been lost and thus that aileron enters third mode operation. Flyers of our 146 professional will be familiar with these control tabs as they are the primary control type for the 146's ailerons and elevator. The control tabs work via a direct mechanical linkage to the yoke and move freely when on the ground. However, note that the actual aileron isn't moving here and that is because there is no air flowing over the surface so the control tab is ineffective at this time. Once air starts flowing over the ailerons, movement of the control tabs will deflect the aileron by a proportional amount. In terms of feel and the force required to move the ailerons in third mode, this is much less than the force required to move the elevators and rudder in third mode operation, as you are only having to move a smaller mass through the yoke compared to the elevators and rudder. The only real difference you will notice in aileron control is at speeds less than 150 knots, where there is less air flowing over the ailerons, causing them to be less effective. An interesting point to ponder here is control tabs are the primary control method used on other aircraft such as the 146 and 737, and the F-28 is using these control methods as a backup to the main hydraulically powered control surfaces. This really highlights just how easy and a joy to fly the real F-28 was when backup non-hydraulically powered flying controls are comparable to the feel of the normal flight controls in a 146 or 737. If the ailerons weren't quirky enough, one final quirk of the F-28 ailerons is the left aileron is hydraulically powered from the utility system, whilst the right aileron is powered from the flight control system. This means that if only one of the hydraulic systems fail, then only the aileron that is powered by the failed hydraulic system will enter third mode operation. So let's say for instance the utility system is offloaded. As the utility system powers the actuators in the left aileron, they will lose their hydraulic power and the left aileron will enter third mode operation and the control tab will become unlocked. And as the right aileron is still being supplied by the flight control system, it will remain in first mode operation with control tab locked in place. Interestingly though, in this situation you wouldn't notice any real difference in feel when operating the ailerons and they will be as easy to operate as they are with full hydraulic power. This is due to the aileron that still remains on first mode operation, still having hydraulic power, and it effectively assists the aileron in third mode operation via an anti-upload cable, which connects both ailerons in tandem. I don't know about you, but all of these redundancies really make you appreciate the safety of aircraft, especially so considering this level of redundancy was fitted to the F-28 an aircraft that first went into production in the mid-1960s. Moving on to the stabiliser. In third mode operation, the stabiliser can be controlled by means of an electric motor. A switch is located on the left side of the pedestal, labelled alternate stabiliser control. Operating the switch up or down will move the stabiliser in the respective direction. However, as the electric motor is much less powerful than the hydraulic actuators, the stabiliser takes significantly longer to alter its position. Be sure to take care when moving the trim wheel when no hydraulic power is applied to the aircraft, as the trim wheel will get out of sync with the stabiliser, and as soon as hydraulic power is reapplied, the stabiliser will snap back to the position set by the trim wheel, making a loud bang in the process. An easy mistake that pilots and engineers would make on the real aircraft too. For ease of use in our simulation of the F-28, we've assigned the same elevator trim control assignments to both normal and alternate trim controls, with only the relevant controls being affected by the control assignments dependent on the current state of the hydraulic systems. One thing to note with each of these four flying controls is when repressurizing the hydraulic system, either after engine start or after manually offloading specific hydraulic pumps, is that all lights must be extinguished on the hydraulic system flight control panel in order for the actuators to be pressurised. If any of these lights remain illuminated with all switches in the correct positions, you must press the reset button on top of the panel. And remember, you've always got the flight control repeater light on the pedestal that will illuminate whenever a light is illuminated on this panel. Moving on to the secondary flying control services, the wing flaps are normally hydraulically powered using pressure from the utility system. If hydraulic pressure is lost in the utility system, 
then the flaps will no longer operate with a flap lever and the operation of the flaps can only be achieved by the alternate flap control switch on the right side of the pedestal. The initial movement of the switch in either direction will automatically depressurize the flap hydraulic system and engage the electric motor. Operation of the flaps with the electric motor is significantly slower compared to hydraulic operation, with normal operation of the flaps from 0 to 42 degrees and vice versa taking approximately 20 seconds. However, for operation by electric motor, this time increases to approximately 1 minute 40 seconds. The speed brakes are normally hydraulically operated using fluid from the utility system via a control lever on the pedestal. In the event of a loss of pressure in the utility system, there will be sufficient pressure remaining in the hydraulic accumulators to extend or retract the speed brakes once. So, if the speed brakes are retracted, you can extend them, but you won't be able to retract them until hydraulic power is restored. So you need to make that extension count. Now also seems a good time to discuss the speed brake blowback feature. At speeds greater than 190 knots, the speed brake will only extend as far as to provide a constant deceleration of 0.1g, regardless of the speed brake lever position. If you are to move the speed brake lever fully aft at 270 knots, the speed brake would initially partially extend, and then as the speed bleeds off, you'll see the speed brake gradually extend until the full 6 degree extension occurs at 190 knots. The speed brakes will also automatically retract whenever the throttles are advanced to or through the throttle detent position. Moving on to the lift dumpers, these are the surfaces on top of the wings that significantly disrupt the airflow over the wing, causing a loss of lift and a significant amount of drag. It is imperative that the lift dumpers are not deployed when in flight, as this could lead to disastrous consequences, so they are mechanically locked in place when in a retracted position. If the ground flight switches detect that the aircraft is on the ground, the lift dumpers can be extended and retracted using the lever on top of the captain's right hand throttle, or by using the F1 and F2 keys on your keyboard. As a fail safe measure, if this lever is in any position other than the fully retracted position, the right hand throttle will be mechanically locked in the idle position. If the lift dumpers are armed, automatic extension will occur on landing or when the speed is above 50 knots and the throttles are retarded below 75% high pressure RPM during an aborted takeoff. If the lift dumpers have been automatically extended, then retraction can only be achieved either by disarming them via the arm switch or by advancing the throttles above 75% high pressure RPM. In the event of a utility system hydraulic failure, accumulator pressure will be sufficient for either one extension or retraction of the lift dumpers. A guarded lift dumper lock switch on the aft side of the pedestal can also be used to shut off the hydraulic lines heading to the lift dumpers in the event of a lift dumper failure, as indicated by the prolonged barber pull on the lift dumper indicator on the glare shield. Operation of this switch causes all hydraulic fluid to return to the reservoir via the return lines, thus hydraulically retracting the lift dumpers. This system is also backed up electrically to ensure the lift dumpers can always be retracted whenever the aircraft has some form of power. Rounding out the flight controls is the gust lock system. This is a mechanical system which locks the ailerons, rudder and elevator in the neutral position when the aircraft is on the ground in order to prevent the wind moving and potentially damaging the flight control surfaces when there is no hydraulic pressure. The gust lock can be engaged by moving the blue gust lock lever on the aft pedestal to the up position. When engaged the gust lock also performs two other functions. It will apply a mechanical lock to the throttles 
to prevent takeoffs with the gust lock engaged and it will deactivate the flight data recorder which will in turn illuminate the flight data recorder caution light on the right side panel. That about rounds out the flight control system in the F-28. Hopefully this video was enjoyable and maybe you learned a thing or two about the F-28 that you didn't already know. On your next flight, why not offload a few hydraulic pumps and see how you get on? It's only a simulator, what's the worst that can happen? Stay tuned to our social channels for some further F-28 content in the near future where we will be showing off a few more features of the F-28 that may have otherwise been missed.